this job just doesn't get any easier. Was it you that found the body? Yeah, I found it by my cave next to my fire first thing this morning. And can I ask what you do? I'm a caveman, same as everyone else. Of course. Yeah. So I found the body first thing and I immediately went to fetch the caveman police. You did the right thing. Leave it to us. We're getting an expert in to determine cause of death. Right. And here is cave woman pathologist Ursula. Morning, detective. Morning, Ursula. This could be an interesting one. Well, let's have a look. Oh, it looks like this man was killed with some kind of stone implement. Not again. It's rife. Sometimes I think the whole advance into stone technology has been a bit of a double-edged sword. No what? Nothing. No, what did you... I've no idea. Time of death? Uh, well, I think I can narrow it down to, uh, some time before now. OK, <laughs> let's start investigating. Did anyone see this man being killed? No. Right, I'm all out of ideas. <laughs> all we know is that at some point before now, someone hit this man to death with a stone and no one saw who it was. The perfect crime. The perfect crime. Two hours ago, our beloved Führer, Adolf Hitler, took his own life. Oh, right. That, that is sad. And you, Admiral Dönitz, have been named as his successor. for Germany. Um, I think we should do more autobahns. They're great. Uh, I think we need to look at pensions. There's a growing housing shortage. Uh, listen. Oh, actually, sorry, can I just make a quick call? Yes, mein Führer. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Hi, darling. Yeah, it, it's me. You're never gonna guess. They've made me the new Führer. <laughs> yeah, 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 shot himself. Frida, this is an opportunity that I've just got to take. Well, they were hardly going to give me the job when everything was going really well, were they? <laughs> Look, we'll talk about this later, OK? But, but uh, hail me, though, eh? <laughs> hail me. Oh. Right, where was I? Oh, yes, ideas. When can we have a policy meeting? We've taken the liberty of drawing up a list of priorities. Oh, yeah? Yeah. So, here's General Eisenhower's telephone number. Here's the English for, we give up. <laughs> and here's an analysis of our military situation in one rude word. <laughs> uh, you're taking the wind out of my sails a bit there. So... Hang on, this, this isn't just one of those pranks you play on all the new Führers, is it? No. Uh, oh, I see. So, you, you, you just need someone to say that we've surrendered? Seems silly, I know, but, um, no, we just literally do need someone, actually, to say we've done that. Right. It's red tape, really. You see, uh, I, I, I thought I was going to get to be a, a proper... Yes, that was our fault. We, um, we didn't mean to give you that impression. All right, I'll, I'll make the call. <clears throat> um, you, you wouldn't mind just doing me a quick Heil Dernitz, would you? J just so I can say I've had one. I don't think that would... Please. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> Hello, and welcome.
Welcome to Word Wang, the spin-off series with a difference, and that difference is words. Joining me tonight are Julie from Yorkshire and Simon, who is from a factory and made from a special metal. <laughs> so, Julie, ever killed a man? No. Simon? Yes. Great, let's play Word Wang. <laughs> Round one, Julie to play first. Shed. Trowel. Buzz. Sorry, are you buzzing in? No. That's Word Wang. <laughs> Simon? Smear. Towards. Fastidious. That's word wang. On to round three, animals. Simon? Mattress. That's word wang. However. That's word wang. Deforesting. That's word wang. Lineage. Oh, bad luck, Julie. That's not an animal. You lose two letters. So, Uli, it's you to start as we move on to the word board. Today's categories, countries of the world. Um, I'll take Bethania, Finland, and the Independent Republic of Yeb. That's word wang. Simon? Um, no, I'll have um, Mimji. Want this stan and uh, Ireland. Oh, bad luck, Simon. I'm afraid Ireland's not a vegetable. You lose three letters. So, as we enter the final round, M, you're leading with tarpaulin, and Uli, you're trailing with H. It's time for you both to face the word wangerator. Let's rotate the ball. <laughs> Welcome back to the word wangerator. Word up, M. Brisket. Oh, good. Uli? Parallel. Nice. 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 Nearly. Almost. Pinch. Embolden. Arbitrarily. Oh. Crevice. E. Crevasse. Oh. Cravat. Mm. Tie? Yes, that is word wang! <laughs> M, you've beaten the word wangerator, making you today's word wang. Uli, you've been word wangerated, making you today's anti word wang. Until tomorrow, <laughs> good work, work! <laughs>young Mark Deacon will be very sad to have missed that blue, but hopefully not as sad as he was about six months ago. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, I think the whole of snooker was very much behind Mark in the terrible battle he's had with his own personal demons. Yes, I'm, I'm sure Mark wouldn't mind it being known that he has, of course, sadly tried to top himself twice. <laughs> Yes, but that's many fewer times than he's tried to reach the final of a ranking tournament. <laughs> and he hasn't managed that either. I still think it was insensitive of Steve Davis to say that to his face. That was cold. I mean, in the middle of the dance floor, at the end of season bash, and Steve Davis, your childhood hero, is screaming at you, cheer the F up, you miserable C. It's <laughs> enough to make anyone reach for the paracetamol. I wouldn't like it. <laughs> so, four bedrooms, off-road parking, nice bit of garden at the back. Great. Here we are. So, Tom's a banker. What does Wendy do? Uh, I work for a charity. Oh, yeah? Which one? It's a charity that provides counselling and practical support for survivors of torture. Torture? Really? Mm. I'll tell you what's torture around here. The traffic. <laughs> Getting around the North Circular every morning. That makes me a torture survivor. Right. No, nah, not really. <laughs> so, you must have some stories. Um, so, go on. What is the worst thing that's ever happened to anyone you've counselled? Oh, well, you know, some not very nice things. Yeah, I bet. But what's the worst thing? I mean, the really gruesome stuff. Look, I don't think... No, come on, what's the really... Oh, my God, I can't believe they do that to people. The most disgusting torture that anyone's ever been through and lived to tell the tale. Look, you really don't want to know. I do. <laughs> no, you don't. I do! I really do! Oh, come on, how bad can it be? Well, um, <laughs> I once worked with someone who... And, obviously, coping with that was very difficult for him. <laughs> so, the ensuite in there is that the only bathroom... You callous bitch. <laughs> Standing around with your latte, looking for somewhere nice with a garden in zone two, when you know what you know about what goes on. You have to learn to remain detached. 
Oh, right. Oh, it's just a job for you, is it? Nine to five. Oh, I'm sorry, Mbulu. That does sound like a pisser. But I've got to knock off half an hour early because I've got to go and see a lovely garden flat in Muswell Hill that's going cheap. And then someone's coming round to mend the dishwasher. But that holds no terror for me because I've not learnt to associate a knock on the door with unspeakable violation. <laughs> I see what you're saying, but everyone has to have a day off. I need a fucking month off now! <laughs> that has brought up a lot of things. Right. A lot of things. I didn't mean to... I think it's best if you go. Don't leave me! <laughs> OK, uh, so we're going to try and stage a bit of a reconstruction, see if it jogs anyone's memory. So, the victim was on his way back to his cave from hunting or starting a fire or... Well, that's it. Off you go, <laughs> on. When the attacker may have done something like this. <laughs> something like that. We don't know. Is he dead now? <laughs> that's a very good reconstruction. <laughs> Yeah, I think what's happened over the last 50 or so years is that shopping has become a kind of leisure pursuit that people can actually enjoy, you know? Yeah, you're right. People have got a lot more money and everything's just a hell of a lot more relaxed now. Can I help you, sir? Yeah, cheers. Um, I'm just vaguely looking at suits right now. Uh, something cash, but also kind of cool and dark, so you can wear it in the evening. A business suit that is simultaneously a dinner suit and a tailcoat and a pair of pyjamas. Yeah, around the kind of 100, <laughs> 150 mark which is fashioned from sackcloth and string. I'm sorry? Do you wish to look smart, or are you merely looking for a newer version of what you're wearing at the moment? Oh, well, if you've got something like this, then... You mean something Italian and ill-fitting, and so shiny I can see my face in it, in stark contrast to your shoes? Uh, yeah. We do not. Sorry, what happened to the friendly Australian girl that used to work here? She's gone, sir. They've all gone. They've all been driven out and the burning remains of their tawdry rags cast after them. And we're back. Who? The incredibly intimidating and aristocratic people who still unaccountably sell clothes. I'm afraid we don't like being talked to by people with their hands in their pockets. I beg your pardon. I'll overlook it just this once. Yes. I've seen you in here before. I've seen you slouching around the place in your slip-on shoes and your motorcycle jacket, looking like a mechanic who's won the pools. I've seen you with your tin earring and your black marketeer swagger. We've all seen you, and we all thought you were a turd. <laughs> now, do you wish to be smart, or do you wish to leave this place as you entered it, looking like a slack-jawed spit? Why are you treating me like this? Because I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you to have standards. I'm trying to make you know that the world isn't pleased to see you. You aren't needed or included or loved. You're ugly and superfluous and ignorant. And you should be frightened and meek and grateful. Right. That's better. Now, first things first, let's get you a hat. Do you think people are going to like these sort of private moments where we're just being ourselves? This isn't private. There's a camera there. <laughs> well, no, but still, it is more, you know, the kind of stuff where... The sort of bits where we're, we're just, just, you know, you know chatting, chatting and, and kind of, <laughs> kind of, I don't know I don't how, to know how it. to put it. Uh, but, uh, you, know, you know, this is all scripted. What? This is as made up as the rest of it. This isn't improvised. Look. Bloody hell. It says I say bloody hell here. Yeah, I know. That's my cue. David? Yeah, I know, that's my cue. Yeah. Robert, reading, David, yeah, I know, that's my cue. Just put that away. It says I don't. Well, what happens next? It says, cut to a close-up of the script. It reads, cut to a close-up of the script. It reads, cut to a close-up of the script. It reads, cut to a close-up of the script. It goes on forever. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> You say shit. That's the penultimate line. <laughs> oh, and that's a bad miss. <laughs> yeah, and viewers in the north may once again be experiencing sound difficulties. <laughs> Come on! Oh, that'll do. Yes, well, that was a lucky chance for young Mark Deacon, but as usual, he approaches the table with... How does one put it? 
a face like a slapped ass. <laughs> Have you ever seen that man smile, Ted? Only in his sleep, Peter. <laughs> Only in his sleep. <laughs> Viewers might want a bit of background on that because I believe it was you, Ted, who foiled one of Mark's, how shall we put it, bids for oblivion, wasn't it? <laughs> I, I have that honour. It was, it was during the Welsh Open and Mark had been knocked out that day and I was just making my way back to my hotel room at, at around about four in the morning from, from the bar and... As luck would have it, Mark had the room next to me in the hotel and, and something had been up all week cos I could hear him late at night singing the snooker words to Lady in Red. I should, I should explain to viewers that there are some special snooker words to the pop song Lady in Red, which all of us in snooker know. <laughs> They're secret special snooker words to Lady in Red that, that we all know. Viewers are perhaps interested to know what the secret special snooker words to Lady in Red actually are. Yes, but unfortunately we're all sworn to secrecy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Mark's hotel bedroom door was open and, and I could hear water running. Tell us again what you did, Ted. Yeah, well, well I went in there and, and I made him sick it all up. But he was inconsolable, kept going on about his queuing, which is far from perfect, but I didn't say that. You did right. I, I remember I just held him for hours until he, he stopped sobbing and managed slowly to drift off to sleep. That was very kind of you, Ted, especially with your back. It, it was murder, Peter, but at least it wasn't suicide. <laughs> So, in Tudor times, you'd have just settled into your bath of baked beans, or more likely water, we're using baked beans to make it a bit more fun, when you think, oh no, I can't reach my bar of Tudor soap without getting out and getting spats of baked bean, or more likely water in those days, but we're using baked beans to make it more fun, all over my nice Tudor floor. And remember, there was no lino in those days. So, the Tudors came up with an ingenious solution which was twofold. So, first of all, there's the horn which you sound to alert your Tudor servants. <laughs> Of course, they wouldn't always hear you because deafness was a big problem in Tudor times, what with the Wars of the Roses and the gigs. So, in parallel, they had this ingenious contraption. How it works is you turn the handle and pull down on the lever and it extends this arm. Now, normally, there'd be some sort of grabber on the end of it, but we're using a boxing glove because it's a lot more fun. And, as you can see, it actually reaches the soap. And, yeah, yes, I, I'd say it. I've touched the soap. I've actually touched the soap. You <laughs> really Nearly finished yet, Jim. That's it. Now, what about that sex we discussed? All aboard that's going aboard, I've got potato crisps on my feet. Jim, I've been meaning to say, could we have sex like we used to without all the wackiness? What wackiness? You know, the cycle helmet and the crisps and the shouting bingo. Bingo! <laughs> Remember when you were sexy? Sexy? You're a very, very sexy man, Jim. You've just forgotten. Sounds a bit poor-faced. I was going through some of your old things the other day. Look at this stuff. You were cool. You were an angry, brilliant young historian. You used to order martinis and only buy cigarettes in soft packs. I just feel so empty. <laughs> Thanks for trying. I was a toss pot. Well, maybe a bit, but couldn't you pretend to be like that again? Oh, all right, Anne. Oh, oh it's so serious. <laughs> oh, play, oh, play. You're not trying. Well, I can't do it, Anne. You're never going to make me regret the day I learned how to make facts fun. I'm never going back. This is it now, Anne. <laughs> With my helmet and my horn and my folding bicycle, I've made millions of people give a shit about the seed drill, and if you <laughs> don't mind, I'm just going to go and wank off about that. Oh, Jim! <laughs> Oh, 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 bingo, bingo, bingo! Please, could you do it without the honking? You know perfectly well that without the honking, nothing happens. <laughs> oh. Oh. So, David, you're a comedian, are you? That sounds like fun. Yes, I suppose it is. <laughs> Actually, there are a couple of funny things happening in our chiropractors. You could probably use them in your comedy show. Seriously? <laughs> well, you probably have people suggesting stuff all the time. <laughs> I wish. No. We're really stuck for ideas. What have you got? Oh, 
well, um, there's funny words like coccyx, which sounds a bit like, uh, well, I don't need to tell you, you're a comedian. Cock! Of course, <laughs> yes. Sounds like cock. Uh, certainly a laugh in that. Oh, super. <laughs> and nothing else, because, as I say, we really are screwed. And any wacky incidents or zany people? Well, there's my assistant, Debbie. She's quite a character. Brilliant. A character. <laughs> so, so, how's your character? Uh, well, she sometimes wears a hat. <laughs> a hat? Good. That could be funny. This is great. Coccyx, a hat. <laughs> well, certainly use both of those. Uh, anything else? No, that's just, I'm afraid, loads of the two funny things. <laughs> oh, that's a shame, because... I must stress that we really are bang out of ideas, and if you can't think of anything, we'll probably just do this. What? This conversation? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's exciting. So, what, you play me? No, I play myself. What? So I play me, then? No, no, we'd get Robert to do it. Well, does he look like me? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. You're not going to try and make me look ridiculous just to get a cheap laugh. <laughs> or give me some kind of gratuitous speech impediment. No, of course not. Oh, uh, I'm worried that you're just going to try and humiliate me on the telly. <laughs> no, not, not, not at all. I, I suppose we might heighten the reality a little for comic effect. <laughs> Hello, Debbie. <laughs> Excuse me. So, sorry, sorry, I'm really sorry to interrupt, but... Excuse me, sorry, but I'm David Mitchell's real chiropractor and... <laughs> I'm actually quite upset, because... <laughs> well, I mean, this isn't... Well, that wasn't... <laughs> anything like the conversation we had in my office the other week. <laughs> For a start, I don't sound anything like that. Sorry. <laughs> and secondly, while I was easing off his sciatic nerve, I told David Mitchell several genuinely amusing chiropractic stories. <laughs> like the time I was treating Tony Blackburn, and afterwards he said to me, if anyone hears the real disc jockey, it's you. <laughs> Which was hilarious. <laughs> that was good, yeah. Still got it. <laughs> the blood of Christ keep your eternal life. The blood of Christ keep your eternal life. <laughs> In a time future historians will one day call the past, and a place I wish I could name, but it's been a confusing week. Who is left to look out for the man in the street in case he wants his mobile back? Yes, it's the surprising adventures of me, Sir Digby Chicken Caesar. Do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? Ginger, do you know who I am? You're Sir Digby Chicken Caesar, sir. Of course. Thanks. The story so far. In my continuing quest to find out just who is behind it all, and by all, I do mean all, Ginger and I have been invited to an evening at Her Majesty's pleasure. But we can't get there because we're in prison. I've got a plan! <laughs> Officer, he's done it! He's gone and done it! I tried to reason with him, but he wouldn't listen. I wish I knew how you did that, Ginger. Well, sir, my dad used to hang me regularly as a child. <laughs> and those were the good days. Ha-ha! <laughs> what happened on the bad days? He tried to have sex with me. Oh, yes. Sorry. Still, that was ages ago. You must be over it by now. Oh, yeah. I think my life's more or less on track now. <laughs> All right, sir. Shall we go down the arcade and look for 10 peas? Ah, a search for clues. Good thinking. 
Where will my nemesis make his first inevitable mistake? Will he abolish the duty on cider, leave a bin full of oyster cards lying around, or will he fall for my latest cover identity, the pimp for some Filipino teenagers? Find out next week in The Surprising Adventures of Sir Digby Chicken Caesar. I got one! Oh, and that's a cracking pot! <laughs> and yet, not so much as a flicker of joy on Mark Deacon's jowly death mask of a face. I mean, he must be pleased. I, I think he's just one of these people who finds it very difficult to be happy. It he thinks too much, Ted. That's his problem. I keep saying to him, Mark, don't go so far inside your head with the snooker. The soul is like a pocket. There's no coming out. Unless you're a colour or the white. <laughs> well, Peter, I know you won't mind me saying, and, and Mark certainly won't, that you've been a tremendous support to Mark over the last couple of years. Especially that other time he took 200 pills. I picked up the phone, Ted. That's all I did. I happened to be there. Mark rang me. Was it a call for help? In a way, it was, yes. What did he say? He said, help. Help me, Peter. Me safety play is all to crap. I can't go on. And you were straight in the car and round there, weren't you, Peter? Just as soon as I got the swing ball in the boot, yes. <laughs> now, Peter, for those of us who don't know the story, explain the significance of the swing ball. Well, it was just a crazy notion that I had that it would help to relax him. And so I got him out in the garden, in the dark, playing swing ball, tears streaming down his face. And I, <laughs> and I said to him, Mark, be honest. Is this not a little bit better than being dead? And what did he say, Peter? He said, yes, Ted. And we played swing ball all through that beautiful night until the sun came up and things started to feel a little better. Well, Mark, this is for you. Never seen you looking so shiny as you did tonight. <laughs> Never seen your base so tight. <laughs> you were amazing. <laughs> Never seen so many players wonder if the long pot is on. <laughs> looking for a little cannon. <laughs> a cut as thin as a thong. <laughs> and I have never seen such a clearance. Such a clearance in all the parks in every way. No more safety play. Table of Reds is dancing with me. Cush to cush. Nothing is wrong. This big pink is on. Where's the cue ball gone? <laughs> and I hardly know <laughs> To play with stun or side <laughs> Never to forget This shot to nothing life Never to forget My table of reds <laughs> That's for you, Mark <laughs> Keep on keeping on God bless and cheer the fuck up <laughs>